Well, it's now 1030 in the morning here in uh, South Dakota, Central Time. Anyway, that's 10 o'clock here. Um, 1030, actually. And uh, welcome to Brainstorming the Human Connection. This is brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. And we'd like to uh, remind people that this is an interactive uh, program where that you have a chance to, uh, in fact, we urge you to come up with your own questions, uh, comments, share your experiences, uh, and uh, that's what makes the program. This has been very interesting this morning. We had some kind of interesting background, uh, our log on problems today. Our guest today, again, is David Adler, and uh, I don't know if everybody here, probably there's some people who weren't here when he's been here before, but um, we're going we're gonna to have him to introduce himself again so that uh, we, we get, I always like to ha have people introduce themselves as they see themselves, because that makes more sense than telling you who I think he is. So, David, welcome again. And uh, tell us tell us something about uh, David. Where where is he? what's he doing? And uh, what's he's in, what what is he interested in? Hmm. Well, good morning, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you again. I admire the work of the South Dakota Humanities Council, and always happy to participate. It's a it's a privilege. Uh, so um, after many years of teaching. Constitution, constitutional law at various universities in Idaho and elsewhere. Um, I've, I've been serving as president of the Alturas Institute based here in Idaho, uh, which is a nonprofit educational organization created to advance American democracy by promoting the constitution, civic education, equal protection, and gender equality. And uh, so I continue to travel around the country and lecture on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and I do a lot of writing, um, including writing uh, newspaper columns, um, which run in South Dakota newspapers, happy to say, uh, with the support of the Humanities Council. Uh, and so I'm, I'm doing uh, what I most enjoy, talking about democracy and the Constitution uh, and getting paid a little bit to boot. So I feel like I'm lucky to be able to do that. Um, so thanks for having me, and I'm always happy to talk uh, about the Constitution and enjoy our conversations. Well, we're going to get right into that. And last time we left off, uh, and there's always much more to talk about in the Constitution, but last time we 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 talked about what uh, where do we go with democracy going forward? We know we talked some before about how we got here. That's where we talked about mostly the last time. But I like to look at what happens to us going forward. What are some of the challenges that we face as a nation going forward with democracy? You know, it's such a big subject, as you indicate, and we face so many challenges, many grave challenges, Lawrence. Uh, speaking, for example, about uh, institutions in America that are critical to the preservation uh, and promotion of democracy, such as um, journalism, such as uh, the three institutions of government, um, adhering to the Constitution and promoting democratic values. And that would certainly pertain to the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches. Uh, so, institutionally, uh, we find that we face grave challenges. It's often the case that the institutions of government are not adhering to the Constitution, not promoting democratic values. Uh, when I speak of journalism, I think I, I'm talking about um, a majestic institution when I talk about freedom of the press. And as everyone knows, newspaper subscriptions have fallen across the country. Uh, and the problem that this reflects, of course, is that so many Americans 
are now deriving their information, not from newspapers that hire professionally trained journalists or even uh, broadcast journalism filled with professionally trained journalists who subscribe to the um, to the journalistic canons of ethics, but from websites, uh, from social media, which don't promote truth and evidence and facts. And so that bothers us greatly because in a democracy, uh, people need to be able to understand uh, facts and evidence and truths to participate in our great national discussions. And of course, that's part of the, the crisis that we face in civic education. Lots of Americans don't have an adequate uh, understanding of the Constitution, about how our government works, and that really deprives them of the knowledge and, frankly, the tools uh, necessary to participate uh, in our system to promote their interest and to defend their rights and liberties, which are so important. And of course, one of the great challenges we face is a, a growing lack of respect for and appreciation for the rule of law. Uh, and that is absolutely critical. It's the backbone for American constitutionalism um, and the the fact that so many now have embraced conspiracies which have no remote uh, connection to truth and facts. And we're seeing this play out now, of course, as Americans react to um, what is expected to be yet another indictment of former President Trump brought by special counsel Jack Smith pertaining to the January 6th insurrection. Uh, so all of these things and a good many others combine to create circumstances in our country uh, where I fear uh, greatly about the future of, a, of American democracy. One of the, you, you've mentioned a few, I think, really key points. And we, we did talk a little bit about uh, the citizens' preparation for uh, operating in a democracy. And one of the things that uh, I guess it seems to me be, to be fundamental is the lack of even the vocabulary to talk about these ideas. It just seems like, you know, like the words, words are, only have the meaning that we give them and that we share in them. If I have one meaning and you have another meaning, clearly we can't communicate with words. We have to do something else. So it just occurred to me uh, recently because of some efforts that I was making that a lot of us don't have uh, a, the vocabulary to even have a discussion, which of course means it's not, vocabulary is not just a stack of words. It's the meaning and the concepts behind those words that we don't have. So I'm wondering like, how do we get to a place where, where one, we can even understand what we're saying when we talk about a democracy. Is that something that can happen in a public forum? Clearly, it's not happening in schools. Well, that's you're, you're so nicely said, Lawrence. You've tapped such an important problem. Uh, of course, we want the schools across America to emphasize civic education. That's, that is citizen preparation, as you point out, critical for our citizens to participate. So in my own view, there ought to be an emphasis on civic education every school year. It's not enough uh, in some states uh, to focus on the Constitution or American government every third or fourth year. It's just not sufficient. So it ought to be an emphasis every year <clears throat> on democracy and the Constitution. But uh, to your point, it certainly can happen in, in, in a public forum. Uh, in, in the conversation that we're engaging in today. Uh, one of the things that, that I do at the Alturas Institute is to travel and give talks about the Constitution and, and to, in an effort to promote the, the civic education uh, for people across the country. And uh, people need to have the vocabulary. For example, people need to appreciate what the rule of law is. If we just focused on that, uh, we would understand that uh, the when the framers implemented the rule of law uh, at their time in 1787, it had a precise meaning. 
which was the subordination of the executive to the rule of law, that the president would be treated like everybody else, not above the law. The president would be amenable to the judicial process like you and I are. Uh, no, James Wilson, one of the great leaders in the Constitutional Convention, said that the president would enjoy no privilege not enjoyed by any other citizen. Imagine that. That was a great effort to say to the American people, we've not created a monarchy here. This president is going to be subject to the criminal process. Over time, of course, one of the problems we've encountered is that presidents have, have acquired more and more power and, and then uh, in recent years have claimed immunity uh, from uh, the criminal process. Uh, and even now, uh, many don't believe that a president should be subject to the criminal process and the rule of law the way others are. But if we were to throw out the concept of the rule of law, it would break the back of American constitutionalism. Or just to give one other example about the rule of law, it means equal protection of the law for all Americans. And of course, we've fought a long battle historically to try to apply that concept to all Americans. We've amended the Constitution. We passed important statutes to advance the right of women and minorities, guaranteeing the right to vote. It's been a long slog, frankly, Lawrence, and we're not there yet. And we continue to face the battle. Uh, not all Americans are in favor, favor of equal protection of the law, but um, so that that's a major problem. So just that issue of rule of law, an understanding of that great concept is important for civic education. And then if I may just mention one other, Americans need to learn that the Constitution does apply to all people. It limits governmental power. It is the source of governmental power and it limits it. Uh, and Americans should not cherry pick when it comes to the Constitution. They can't say, well, we like the Second Amendment, but we don't like equal protection so much. Or we like freedom of religion, but not freedom of speech for all. Cherry picking uh, to turn the Constitution into Swiss cheese, sorry to mix metaphors here, um, what is the is the way that uh, we undercut and ultimately ultimately destroy the Constitution? So, whether our party is in power, whether our favorites are in power, we need to understand that the the Constitution and the rule of law should apply equally to all people all the time. I think we touched on this subject before, but I think it it it. Uh probably could use a little bit more conversation just to bring things into focus. We start in this conversation with the Constitution, but I think a lot of people have not really settled on what is the point of government in the first place. Uh, people sometimes see government as the enemy or sometimes maybe as a savior or whatever, but the whole point of why have government of any kind, whether it's the tribal chief or, you know, a president or anything in between. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the point of having any kind of government is? Sure. It's um, the point is the fundamental point of having government is that we need to organize the country. We need to organize the nation so that we can serve the interests of the people, protect their rights, so that the rights and liberties of the people are not violated or ignored by um, strong men or uh, politically manipulative individuals and groups who would exploit the interests of the people. Uh, we need to organize government so we can promote education, so we can pave the roads, uh, so government is, is an organizational entity that we the people have created in a, in a democracy such as ours. We the people created a government and granted it only limited powers to serve our ends. Uh, and as James Madison said, uh, we, have, we have drawn government from the liberty of the people. The people have given their assent to our form of government in stark contrast um, to that which exists in many countries around the world 
where government is simply imposed upon the people and the people have uh, no say in whether they want a particular government. So uh, when, uh, when the framers wrote the constitution and the American people ratified it, it was an exercise in what we would call the social contract. And, and this is reflected in the first sentence of the preamble of the Constitution, which says, we the people ordain and establish this Constitution to serve particular ends. What a historical feat. That had never happened in the country. And even though our democracy at the time was flawed, obviously, and the Constitution didn't apply equally to all people, uh, it was the sense of the founders, according to Abraham Lincoln, who was a pretty good authority, that the day might come in America when the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the principles of the Constitution could apply to all people. It would reflect uh, that point uh, when we would obtain some political maturity and the aspirations of the founders could be realized. And uh, at different points in our history, we have hoped that we have reached that point of maturity when we passed the Reconstruction Amendments, for example, or we passed, uh, we amended the Constitution to give women the right to vote and so on and so forth. So our democracy is an organizational feature. It's not settled in stone. It's an evolving entity, an organic document, uh, speaking of the Constitution, that needs to be uh, revised uh, to keep up with the needs of the people at any particular time. If we don't revise the Constitution to meet the needs of the people, then it really has no benefit. It wouldn't work very well for us to simply to, to adhere to a Constitution written in 1787 in a world that no longer exists. We still apply those principles to new evolving problems and challenges. But uh, it has to be maintained, and that's what is important about civic education, because it gives all of us the opportunity to voice our views on how the Constitution might be changed or what laws we need in our country to better serve our nation, whether it's in education or national defense or uh, tax policies or, for example, uh, protecting the American people uh, from climate change. We're knee deep into the problem of climate change. And uh, boy, has is, is there ever been an area where we more need the voices of people to say, we're ready to make some sacrifices to save the planet. It's the only one <laughs> that we're currently living on. So we should take some measures uh, to protect it for, for us and for future generations of human beings. You know, what you bring up brings up to me that people are, or humans are feeling beings that think, not thinking beings that feel. And we talk some about the, the technical things, for example, lack of vocabulary, lack of knowledge, how the Constitution works, and those kind of things. But it also seems to me that a lot of it has to do with how people feel. I mean, we can have all those tools. But if we don't change our hearts or if we don't if, if we if we are still selfish and if we still say, well, how can I make this thing work for me and who cares about the other people? It doesn't really matter what the Constitution says or what, you know, what uh, technical skills we have in 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 making the Constitution work. If we make it work for, let's say, ulterior motives or things that doesn't work for everybody, it seems like that. That's on a collision course. What can we do? What can we do, or what should we be trying to to uh, get people to the point where they 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 feel something different, not just think something different? Yeah, I like that point a lot, Lawrence. That's really <laughs> important. Um, Judge Learned Hand, one of the great appellate court judges in our history, said that liberty is written in the hearts of people. And we do we want liberty? And in the same way, we could expand that and say sympathy and empathy and other great virtues and values are, are in our hearts. If they're not in our hearts, then we can't promote the um, general welfare 
of Americans uh, of all classes across this country. The uh, democracy is a system uh, that reflects a community of interests. We have shared values, shared interests. Doesn't mean that we'll always have the same interests and values, but we have many shared values. And so the idea is to uh, tap into the shared values and interest and uh, create laws and policies that reflect those values and interests uh, and then promote them to serve everybody's interests. Uh, this idea that Somehow we should all live in silos uh, according to the dictates of our tribes uh, does not promote uh, democratic governments and certainly does not promote uh, the interest of individuals and certainly not the country. The very idea that we have shared interests is reflected in the Constitution, which speaks to the promotion of the general welfare, the blessings of liberty, for example. Uh, and the idea, of course, moving more broadly, uh, that we all have an interest in securing our nation. We all have an interest in protecting rights and liberties. We have lots of shared interests and values, uh, and we, we can't exist in a silo, and we can't live life uh, in a way that says, I'm going to get mine. I don't care about yours. I'm going to exploit you to get mine. And the whole idea of paying taxes, of course, is as Oliver Justice Holmes said, is to buy civilization. That's what pays for civilization. Well, we expect people to pay their fair share of taxes. That's, that's a code of honor and it helps to uh, support society. We, we don't want tax cheats. We want people who will pay their fair share. Uh, so this is a very broad subject that, that you've raised, and rightly so. And uh, we have to have a community of interest where we have sympathy and, and empathy uh, for fellow human beings. And for many, this can be rooted in religious philosophy uh, or other kinds of philosophies. But if we think of America as being grounded in a social contract where um, we all agree to try to promote shared interests, uh, that's a much better nation than one torn apart uh, by all kinds of divisions, which is where we currently find ourselves, I think. So I want to get back to that, the idea of the social contract, because I think that's one that needs to could use a little bit more exploration, but I want to open it up at this point to our esteemed panel, all those folks who have uh, joined us here for this conversation, this brainstorming our human connection. Anybody have any questions or, or uh, comments for David? Go ahead, Annie. <clears throat> Yeah, hi, I'm Annie. I'm a folklorist and I work for the uh, State Arts Council and I'm based out of Rapid City. And, and um, the, your, the last 10 minutes, I've been feeling that these, this, ideal, this idea of democracy is so aspirational that it's unrealistic for us. I, we don't have Collectively, we don't have that social contract. We don't have that compassion. We don't have liberty in our hearts. And we don't want to pay for civilization. And um, is it, it has, is, and is democracy and capitalism contrary to one another? And, um, is is democracy a realistic goal? You know, can we achieve the the um, goals set out by having a fully functioning democratic, con you know, mm -hmm. country, nation, city? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Annie. Uh, nice to see you. The um, the reality here is that our democracy has always been flawed. It's an ongoing enterprise. Uh, and, and just as we say, as the constitution says, we're trying to create a more perfect union. So we're always striving. It is, as you point out, an aspirational uh, goal. 
Um, I think the starting point, and your points are so well made, uh, the starting point for trying to help Americans understand why democracy is so important and best serves their long-term interests is to remind people that of all the good things that we have in life, they have come to us by virtue of the existence of democracy. That may sound a little bit bold and broad, but the fact that we have public education, the fact that we have roads that are paved, the fact that we have functioning governmental agencies, which although not perfect, uh, try to promote the quality of life. Uh, because in contrast, uh, people who live under authoritarian regimes uh, in, in the fascist nations uh, in the past and maybe currently, uh, don't have a system where people can voice their views, uh, raise their voices, uh, announce their values, fight for their, uh, their particular perspectives. Even if they don't win, they would have the opportunity. So to create a system in which people can participate and voice their values uh, gives a vent to a great human need. And that is, we want to express our opinions. Uh, we have a great need to express our opinions. And uh, there's every reason to believe that uh, people uh, can enjoy a better life if they live in a democracy. Now, having said all that, and we're all aware of the problems that we face, how to instill that in the hearts of people uh, and beyond simply saying you're better off if we have a democracy, the reality is that um, great human needs and values uh, can be better expressed in a democracy. They can be fulfilled. Uh, we can bloom as individuals through freedom of speech, for example, through protection for freedom of religion, because then we can live our lives, for example, in accordance with the dictates of our conscience. We can live our lives in accordance with uh, how we view the arrangements of the universe, uh, maybe our relationship with God. Those are very important human needs. And then if we broaden that slightly uh, to think about the, uh, the great, indeed the critical element to make democracy successful, and, and that is people need to be well-informed. It doesn't do us much good to be shouting into the void, so to speak, devoid of knowledge and uh, information, but we need that information. And that's the great important role played by a free press. Remember, it was Thomas Jefferson uh, who would have his quarrels uh, with the press, certainly. Nevertheless, uh, said that if he had a choice between living in a country without newspapers or uh, in a country with newspapers but no government, he would choose having access to newspapers so that people could be informed, knowledgeable. Knowledge enriches our minds. It facilitates critical thinking. And in a democracy where governmental accountability is so important, we want people to be able to hold government accountable by uh, understanding what government is doing in terms of laws and policies, programs, and actions. If we don't have newspapers, uh, then we have no idea what our government is doing, whether it's in South Dakota or in Washington. So, um, so our constitution protects important rights that people can access can exercise as a means of better promoting democracy. But I think to end where I started, we should all understand that the good things that we have in this nation are the result of democratic governance, still evolving, certainly still um, not free from flaws or warts, but a far better system uh, than any that would deny people the right uh, to express their views and to participate. And that's why civic education is so important, so we can understand how we can participate. That's really important. Um, and, and there are ways to do it uh, through participation in local governmental affairs, um, attending city council meetings, county commission meetings, 
writing letters to the editor, responding to letters to the editor, um, participating in that same manner, but at a higher level uh, through our state legislatures and upward. Um, so I like your points. Uh, we have to help people understand how lives are better off in a democracy. Thank, Thank you, David. You. Uh, anyone else have uh, something they want to say? I was oh, I was yeah. thinking um, uh, where I am at fault, and I was thinking um, these sort of issues were not brought up at the table when I was young. Uh, and then I thought, well, what is it that I do? And um, I think that the average person pays their taxes, and then they vote, and they wait for the government to take care of it. The people they voted for, they're gonna take care of it. My taxes will take care of it. Um, I remember traveling to a third world country and uh, there was a slight uh, little rain and there was a mud hole. And uh, the one person said that was from that area, don't, don't drive through that, you'll, you'll fall into a hole. And I thought how different this was from the United States because when there's a hole in the road as a rule, there's a big warning sign. So our streets are paved and when we're on them, we expect if there's anything wrong with them, a sign to be put up and them to be repaired. We can't, other, other countries, you may drive into off the cliff or whatever, but just uh, everything's done for us here. All the safety precautions, uh, buildings, you know, everything is done. So I think that we put out a little bit of effort, we pay our taxes and we vote, and then it's done. And if the parents are not actively participating in uh, local government um, or instilling it in the child, it's not gonna be transferred to that child's future as an adult, and I would say that is so for me. Um, but it's not that way in all countries. One of the things I noticed, I think when I was in Paris or something, people were talking about politics and really going at it. And I think when I was in Thailand, they asked me, well, what do you think about the mines in South Dakota? And uh, I, I really didn't have any idea what he was talking about. And I could tell he was shocked at my lack of knowledge. So what makes one country, even if it's a third world country, or maybe because it's a third world country, more active in their government and what's going on than the United States? Have we just become lazy and counting on other people to take care of it for us? I like those points, and certainly your your vast international travel has informed your perspective. That's really very, very nice. The um, I think that so often Americans take democratic government for granted uh, and uh, rely on others to simply fulfill their needs uh, uh, and believing that good policies and programs and laws will be passed to serve the interests of the people. That's not the way it works, of course, uh, because in a democracy, there is a very strong competitive element, uh, and that means we have to participate. Um, and so as informed citizens, uh, we can be uh, more uh, effective uh, at the local or county levels or the state level uh, by informing ourselves, raising our voices, criticizing government. It's certainly patriotic to criticize government. Sometimes people, um, in my experience, have said, well, if you criticize government, you're not patriotic. But of course, that's not true. And all we have to do is to remember that the founders of our nation were members of the greatest dissenting generation in the history of the world. After all, they dissented from English policies and programs and laws and launched a revolution. And then they enshrined in the First Amendment uh, the right of free speech, uh, which surely included uh, the right to critique and criticize government. So it's very much patriotic to criticize government. Um, loving one's country doesn't 
always mean that we love the policies and programs of different governments across our country. So we need to participate for sure. And this is part of holding government accountable. James Madison, the father of the constitution uh, said that the great challenge confronting uh, our system uh, was in fact uh, obliging government to obey the constitution. That's the great problem. And more broadly speaking, that means obliging government to obey the constitution and the laws of the United States and to um, adhere to democratic values. So Americans have a principal role. Madison, again, in Federalist 51 said that uh, we place a principal reliance upon the people uh, in a republic, that is so critical. We place a principal reliance on the people to monitor government, to be uh, vigilant in watching what government does. And, and we do this uh, because the Constitution was written for the people, not the, not the government. And so that's our opportunity, and I think it's our duty. Um, and, it, and it raises many, uh, many difficult issues, to be sure. Uh, and uh, it's not easy for everybody to participate. Um, certainly that's the case. And we can only do what we can do. And, and if the most we can do, and this is not insubstantial, is to read the newspapers and write letters to the editor, take a few minutes to voice our views, offer critiques and criticisms, and maybe constructive solutions to problems, that's not unimportant. That's not insignificant. It is playing our part. Others have more time. They have more resources and they can participate uh, in, a, in a broader uh, way. So we can all play our roles. And that's why uh, hometown newspapers are so important. They've been the backbone of American democracy. Uh, and I know that South Dakota has many newspapers to its credit. People in South Dakota read newspapers and that's, that's very important. You know, it re this reminds me of a, of another point that, um, that was just raised uh, a minute ago about the compatibility of democracy and capitalism. The two don't always coincide easily. There's a, there's a rough edge between the two uh, because the, the great aim of capitalism is to concentrate wealth in a few. That's the great aim, to acquire as much wealth as you can. That's the that's the, um, uh, that's the pulse of capitalism. Democracy, on the other hand, as Aristotle said, is to spread power as widely as possible. And if we understand as our founding fathers believed, and John Adams was one who voiced it, that, that in fact power follows property, it means if you're wealthy, you have a better chance of exercising more power in our system. Um, we realize that you can give campaign contributions, you can hold events, you can do a lot of money, a lot of things with money. So the key here is to create a more a greater compatibility between the effects of capitalism on our system and the great virtues and values of democracy. And toward that end, uh, we have governmental regulation. We regulate uh, the acquisition of wealth. We regulate, um, uh, we regulate the ways in which wealth can be distributed through our tax code, for example. The, the founders were not people uh, who believed that, that there should be no governmental regulation of the economy. On the contrary, they passed laws to regulate the economy. Um, otherwise, in a capitalist system, capitalist system uh, you would have capitalism uh, and its effects overwhelming the entire nation. So uh, we return to a fundamental point um, that uh, Lawrence and I were discussing last week, as a matter of fact, uh, that we want government, we need government, and we need governmental regulation. We just don't know how much governmental regulation and the kinds of regulations uh, that we need. And people quarrel about that, understandably, uh, but let's let us understand uh, that governmental regulation of the economy was and remains a critical feature 
of our constitutional system. So thank you for raising those many fine points. It, it does sound like um, you're hoping that within the school system, uh, that will be the start of it because it's not, the, the parents aren't teaching the children to, to take an active role. Parents maybe are busier than they ever were, but um, you're, you really point to the schools to really start this uh, turnaround, right? Yes, I like that point. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I have the privilege of working with school teachers around the country, talking about the Constitution, providing ideas for, uh, for teaching the Constitution and our democracy. I admire school teachers. I think we all should. After all, it's not a profession that people enter to get rich, for sure. And the reality here is that it's uh, closer to a calling. Uh, teachers are dedicated. They spend a lot of time uh, trying to uh, help raise children. Sometimes teachers spend more time with uh, children than the parents of the children do. At any rate, uh, the reality here is that teachers want to help. And in, in my own experience across the country, teachers are a dedicated bunch when it comes to promote, when it comes to teaching about the Constitution and American government. And yes, uh, we need more of an emphasis. There should be more time spent uh, in the classroom uh, every day, every year to create citizens uh, who can effectively participate. It's an investment in, our, in the future of our nation. If we, uh, if we provide uh, regulations for teachers to promote uh, the civic education all the time. I can't think of a better investment uh, beyond students learning to read and write and think critically than to uh, teach students about how the, what the constitution means and how our system works. Then they can be effective participatory citizens of the sort that a democracy requires. I would like to move to uh, uh, move back to the social contract. Mm -hmm. Can you talk some about the social contract? What does that What does that mean, and what does it mean to democracy? I, I, that's such an important question. Thank you, Lawrence. The reality is, is that every government has a creation story. And so the question historically um, addressed by scholars and philosophers over the centuries is, what's the origin of government? One explanation, of course, is that uh, strong men and women perhaps uh, simply rise to power uh, back in the day. Now, whoever could wield the sword more effectively would become the ruler. Well, that's one line of thought. Government is a creature of force and violence and power. Another tradition, among others, is ours, which in which we say that the people have created a government uh, to serve their interests, to protect their rights. This is the social contract theory. Uh, which the founders of our nation embraced by reading principally uh, writers in the mid-17th century in England, those people who were out of power, seeking to limit monarchical authority and advance the rights and interests of both parliament and English subjects. And so there were a number of social contract theorists that emerged. One of the most familiar names would be John Locke, uh, who actually published a book in 1691 called The Second Treatise of Government. He was an Englishman who had borrowed from the writings of his forebears who had written in the mid-17th century during the English Civil Wars. And, and Locke borrowing from uh, this very important um, tradition uh, said that uh, before there's government, People live in what we would call a state of nature. There is no government, no rules, no laws, no institutions, no gray buildings. We just exist. Not sure where that might be, uh, but suppose we live in this state of nature 
and life is pretty idyllic. People are guided by what we call the principles of natural law uh, and natural rights, and people generally are pretty kind to each other, helpful and supportive. It seems like an idyllic circumstance. But of course, it's to be expected as Locke and others in the social contract theory write, uh, things change dramatically. Uh, things go south. Uh, people who are more interested in manipulation begin to take advantage of others, exploit others. Uh, the strong manipulate the weak. And pretty soon, as people perceive that this once idyllic circumstance uh, no longer exists, people say to themselves, we need to create a civil society. We're going to sit down. We're going to create a, a contract which both creates society and government. It's a two-step process. We're going to leave the state of nature we're going to create civil society and we're going to create government. And when we create this government, we the people are going to determine how much power we want to give to government. Maybe a lot, maybe a little, but we're going to also spell it out. Certain legislative powers, certain executive powers. What an opportunity to be the authors of our own governmental system. That's what the social contract is about. And then it means, of course, that the people are consenting to be bound by the rules and laws enacted by the government that they have created because it's their government. And this is important to protect the rights and liberties of people uh, so that uh, the physically strong are not abusing them, uh, the mentally clever are not exploiting them. So government is created to protect our rights, the rights that we have granted to ourselves. We, we write down what rights we want, free speech, freedom of religion, and so forth. What an act of empowerment to sit down and write the social contract. So we say that our constitution is roughly a social contract. Now, we don't say that there's ever been, historically speaking, a social contract. It's a theoretical concept but um, America simply embraced the idea when we wrote the Constitution that we will have representatives of the people write a Constitution, and then we present the document to the people for their approval. We can vote up or down. We can vote to ratify or reject. So there are similarities to this theoretical idea. So what the social contract does then is it explains the origin of American government. And it, it states the most important principles that the only legitimate government that exists is one that rests on the consent of the people. How have we given our consent? We've given, given it through the act of ratification, not only of the original constitution, but all the subsequent amendments that we, the people, have approved. Uh, and at all events, uh, government has to be responsive to the people's needs. Why would we have created a government? Why would we have left the state of nature only to create a government that would impose itself on us, behave in undemocratic ways, ignore our needs? That would have been foolhardy of the people to have left the state of nature. So it's a two-way obligation. The government has to adhere to the Constitution. It has no other authority. And at all events, we remember that the Constitution was created by the people, which empowers government. And so that's why we speak so much about the rule of law and emphasize that all governmental actors are bound by the Constitution. They don't have any authority to break the law. They don't have any authority to exceed their constitutional powers. And enforcement of the contract is undertaken by checks and balances, separation of powers, judicial enforcement, um, an expectation that the men and women at the helm will have a conscience and will say, well, it's my duty to obey the law and not to ignore or circumvent the law simply because it serves my own immediate interest. And the other part of the duty, as we've said, is for the people to hold government accountable, to speak up. If it works that way, then we have a government in theory, which is responsive to the needs of the people. 
um, and will protect our rights and serve our interests. That's a great theoretical construct. It's the kind of system that we would rather live in rather than an authoritarian system. And so that it's what bothers me today so much, Lawrence, that so many people are not interested in defending our democracy. And we have people who have even invited uh, an autocratic leader of Hungary to come address them. We have members of Congress who are fans of Putin and say Putin should come speak to us. My goodness, um, Jefferson and Thomas Paine and the great leaders of our founding period would be truly rolling over in their graves to think that any member of Congress would be saying, let's invite an autocrat to help straighten out our nation. Let's invite Putin to come. We need to be more like Russia. Wow, that just um, that sends shivers up my spine when I hear those representatives in Congress mm -hmm. say such ridiculous things and dangerous things. You know, uh, uh, as was said before, you know, we we need to uh, the children have the future, and that's where our future lies. At least old guys like me, we're pretty much you know done here. But it, it has to be about the about the the children, and the parents uh, have been uh, and are quite busy. And quite frankly, many of them don't know what to teach. You know, it's like often we say, well, it's the parents' responsibility, but the parents were never taught that and their parents weren't and the parents before them. So, you know, it it seems to me that, the you know, giving that responsibility to the parents without preparing the parents and not having a, a, a way for them and time, because without that, it's just cocktail talk. They, they If they don't have the tools to do that, then it just simply doesn't get done. And it's just a way to say, well, we don't care if it gets done, at least in my view. So I'm wondering, like, what are some ways that we can uh, bring young people into not only the theoretical, but the practicum or the practical sense of, of exercising democracy, but fundamentally, having at heart the the social contract, which you were talking about just before, to have that ingrained in like, okay, that's how we think. That as Americans, we have to look out for everybody. We have to have a, 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 a mutual protection pact, so to speak, that we all look after each other. And, and like, you have any ideas about how we might go about creating such a situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the reality here is that we have to remind students and really people of all ages uh, that they can make a difference in our mm -hmm. system if they participate. Every vote can make a difference, particularly in those very close elections that we've witnessed. That's important. Uh, more broadly, we can say that you can choose to sit on the couch uh, and to have no effect, no influence in, in how government is going to govern in ways that will affect every aspect of your life. Or you can uh, climb off the couch and participate, vote, uh, raise your voice. And the reason why you should do that is because you recognize, we say to the students, that decisions of government are going to have a profound effect on your lives. If you take the biggest impact, the decision to go to war, for example, which is the most monumental decision that any government could make uh, because it runs, the, going to war runs the risk of uh, widespread death or you destroy the treasury of the nation. Lots of horrible things can happen. Uh, now there might be reasons for going to war, but you would want to be able to express your view on whether going to war is the right thing to do. Uh, and so that's the, maybe the most profound way to say it. The other is in a way that's going to affect the lives of, of uh, today's students or tomorrow's adults is look at taxing policy. Uh, do, do you want higher taxes, lower taxes? Uh, how should the taxes be applied? Should it be based on 
on people's earnings do you want? What kind of a tax system is fair? Um, and that's going to affect your lives because it's going to determine how much you want to spend on education. Do you want better schools? Do you want to recruit good teachers? Um, do, you, do you want to pave the roads and fix the holes uh, so that cars aren't swallowed up in the roads? Do you, what kinds of institutions and programs and policies do we want that are going to affect your lives? Uh, do you want a, a, a governmental agency that's going to make sure that we're not eating uh, poisoned foods? That uh, Do we want an agency that makes sure that the automobiles that we drive are safe? Do we want uh, governmental agencies, and, and I pray that we do, that are going to strive to develop programs and policies to fight climate change? All of these, this, those five or six issues that I mentioned, have a direct, immediate, uh, and long-term effect on the lives of students as they grow older. Uh, so I think that's one way to tell them you can make a difference uh, in your own lives and, and ultimately the lives of your children uh, as well. Maybe that's a selling point. I hope. I hope it is um, because it goes to quality of life issues. Uh, and maybe one great way to appeal to the hearts of people to return to an early theme of our conversation, maybe one way to appeal to the hearts of people is to ask them to contemplate the impact of the laws and policies and programs on their lives and on the people they live, uh, they love, and in the communities in which they live. And you want to make a difference. I, I want to add to that, that, you know, each of us, in addition to voting and being functionally involved in government, we can reach out to to each other on a on that human level, because I think a lot of what's missing is the 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 empathy and the connection. That's why we call this brainstorming the human connection, because a lot of the human connection is missing. You know, it, I noticed in prison that the people who are, uh, let's say, the hardened criminals, they don't have this sense of connection to the broader society. When I, when I just in conversation, uh, people who are, are in prison because of, let's say, robbery or burglary or something like that, they see that as their job. They don't see, I mean, it's not like they, they don't see it. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but I'm, I have talked to people who see that burglary is a job in which is, let's say it's a, a um, it, it's an occupation that the society doesn't like, you know, kind of like prostitution and in some cases gambling and, you know, but it's one in which they can get paid and they figure they can function in that. They can do that. You know, in fact, I remember this one, this one guy said, well, I got into Berkeley because it's the only thing that anybody ever said, hey, you, you're pretty good at that. Huh. You know, all the other things the kid was doing, and he helped his uncle uh, burglarize this place, and his uncle was the first one to ever say, damn, you're pretty good at this, you know, and he said, so he, 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 he developed that into a career, but that huh. means that you don't have a sense of empathy and connection with the rest of your society. So I, I'd like to bring that into like, you know, how do we bring people into feeling the connection that if you feel that connection, you don't, you don't harm your neighbor if you feel like that's you, you know, and 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 you feel some you, you like that person. So you don't do bad things to them, you know. I, um, I think that's so, so important, such a vital point. We hope that we acquire empathy as we grow up. And we, we understand the circumstances that people face. But it's also part of the broader uh, aspect of democracy uh, that we don't have time to talk about today, but it's about the importance of tolerance, the importance of respecting the dignity of human beings. That's part and parcel of a democracy as well. You can't be calloused toward fellow human beings. Uh, for people who are religious enthusiasts, those are creatures of God. And so, and for others, it's simply a philosophical doctrine. You don't use people. People are not means to an end. Many different ways to teach it 
Um, and maybe that's another subject for another time, Lawrence. It, yeah, well, unfortunately, we, we have run out of time, but I certainly enjoy these conversations and I would like to have you back again and uh, so that we can explore this more. Thanks everyone for being here. It's, uh, this has been the Brainstorming the Human Connection, an interactive program with, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. Please join us again next week, same time, same station. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.